So let's um, let's review a little bit what was just on the quiz. So when we do probabilities, there is a keyword that tells us that we're going to have to add the probabilities up. Do you guys remember what the keyword was? Yeah, it's the word or. Now there is a formula. There's a formula that I highly recommend you memorize because I don't think I'm going to put these formulas up on the test. When we do probabilities, there's three formulas you're going to have to remember. Um, the one that we're talking about right now for the review is the one that, that has the word or in it. So if you see the word or, it means find each probability separate and add them up. So when it's probability of A or the probability of B, find the probability of A, add it to the probability of B. Now what does it mean if you add those probabilities and it goes like higher than one? Yeah, that means you got something that got double counted because we're not supposed to go over 1.0. So that means that we have to subtract the shared stuff. So the probability of A and B occurring at the same time. Now technically, if, if you go look at a, a, a book that has probability in it, usually they'll separate these into two formulas. They'll give you one that's uh, mutually exclusive. They'll give you one for when it's not mutually exclusive. Guys, if it's mutually exclusive, that just means the and part is zero. Mutually exclusive means there's no sharing. It doesn't belong to, to uh, the two categories that we're talking about at the same time. So I don't see what's the sense of memorizing two formulas when one will do it every time. You can just ignore the last part if it's mutually exclusive. So it says, um, are events A and B mutually exclusive? So take a look at these guys. So uh, this is tied into exactly what I was just talking about. Look at this. If these are mutually exclusive, this equals zero. When, oh my gosh, I spelled it wrong. When mutually exclusive. So there's a really fast way to tell whether or not this is mutually exclusive. So I gave you some probabilities down here at the bottom. It says the probability of A is 0 0.31 and the probability of B is 0 0.42 and then it says the probability of A or B is 0 0.7. Now think about what I just said. If this is mutually exclusive, that means this isn't here, right? So doesn't that mean when we add our two probabilities, the A and B probability, it should be equal to A or B? That's, what, that's basically what it means. If you have this 0 at the end, that doesn't impact it in any way. So all we have to check is, if I add this to this, does it really give me this? If it does, it's mutually exclusive. If it doesn't, then it's not mutually exclusive. Does it? 0 0.31 plus 0 0.42. Is that 0 0.7? No. Yeah. It's, what is it? 7, what is it? 0 0.73, so it goes over. So that means that these... These events are not mutually exclusive. So I put no. I'm going to be mad about it too. No. It's not mutually exclusive because they're not adding up right. So that means that there's an and part to this. There's an overlap. So if we got 0 0.73, that means that the overlap is 0 0.03 because it went over too much. It's supposed to be 0 0.7. Okay, so now. Today's lesson is on a different type of probability. It's, um, it's, it's when you have basically like more than one event occurring at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but consecutively. Now, when, when you talk about an or event, what, if I say what's the probability of this or this happening, it's actually just one event. But the probability increases because we're adding up two different probabilities. So it makes it more likely when we say or. Um, if I was to change the word to like, what's the probability of this happening and then this happening, that actually makes it harder because it has to happen in a certain sequence. Now before, um, before we get into calculating these probabilities, you have to understand the difference between a dependent and an independent event. Because just like mutually exclusive and not mutually exclusive, it affects how you calculate things. Um, so first we're going to talk about what it is to be independent versus dependent. So I'm just going to underline some key points in this paragraph. It says, the independent event is an event that is not affected by anything that happens before it. 
That's the basic definition of an independent event. So that means you're going to basically cal calculate uh, two probabilities, and the second probability is not affected by what happens first. There's a couple of different ways that could happen. The big one is this. This is a key word that tells you right away it's independent. Like think of a deck of cards. How many cards are there in a deck of cards? So I could give you a story that says, what's the probability of me selecting a king, keeping it out, and then selecting a queen? So in that event, the second probability, the total number of cards now changes to 51. The second event was directly affected by what happened in the first event. So anytime your total changes, that right there is automatically, actually that's the wrong example. With replacement means you put it back. The example I just told you is the dependent event. So dependent events is when you remove the item, or you keep it out, or you do it without replacement. Independent is when you put it back. So if I pick a card, put it back, and then pick another card, the bottom of my fraction stays 52. So that means the second probability was not affected by what happened first. Now the only other scenario for independent is when you have two things that are completely unrelated. Picking a card and flipping a coin. Does it matter what card comes up? And is that going to affect what happens to the coin? No, they're completely independent of each other. Um, rolling, rolling dice. Even if you took the same dice and rolled it twice, if I roll a one, does that mean I can't get a one next time? No, it's not affected. So there are certain events that are just always independent. Bless you. Um, dice, spinners, um, flipping the coin. Those are always independent. It doesn't matter what happened before. It has no impact on what happens next. So just a quick summary of what I just said. An independent event is when one probability does not affect the next one from happening. Um, a key word is when you put it back, because that keeps your bottom the same. Um, or you could also have two just completely random events that have no impact on each other. That makes it independent. Dependent is the exact opposite. Dependent is when you have these couple of events that are happening, or more than one event, and you're removing an item from the total. Anytime you keep it out, you're affecting the second probability. Um, the other one, well, I guess it's the same kind of word. It's just without replacement. So you take the, the, the card out, and you leave it out, and then you try to pick another card. So dependent is when the second fraction is affected by the first fraction, by whatever we decided to do with that um, thing that we picked. So the first thing we're going to do is we're not going to calculate any probabilities just yet. All I want to do is make sure that you know the difference between dependent and independent events, because it's going to affect which formula we're going to use. It says... What is the probability of flipping tails on a coin and then drawing a king of hearts from a deck of cards? Is that dependent or independent? Independent. Flipping a coin does not determine what card we're going to get. So this is an example of independent. Using a six-sided die, what is the probability of rolling a three on the first roll and then on the second roll, rolling a three again? That's another example of independent. Why is it independent? It's because when you roll die, the second roll is not affected by what happens first. Every side of the die has a chance of one in six of occurring no matter what. So it doesn't change just because we rolled a certain number. What is the probability of drawing an ace on the first draw and then drawing a spade on the second draw? And there's a key word right there. It says, without replacing the first card. That's a huge clue. That is a dependent event. The next one is, you have a bag of five marbles. Three of them are green and two of them are blue. What is the probability of drawing a green marble, not putting it back, and then drawing another green marble? This is another dependent one. Key words again, not putting it back, without replacing. Number one and number two, there are two events that don't affect one another. So that's why they're independent. So now we're going to get into the formulas. 
and the key words for this one, and or and then. So what's the probability of picking a king and then picking an ace? So it's basically two events in sequence, so in order. So all you have to do is multiply the probabilities together. And we're going to talk about this dependent one because um, that dependent one is only for some special cases. So I'll tell you about that in a minute. For the most part, the independent formula also works on um, some of the dependent ones. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So we determined these are the same problems from the other page. We said this was independent. So we want to find the probability of flipping tails on a coin. So we want to do probability of tails. And then the probability of drawing a team. So we, we saw the keyword and, or and then, so that's what tells me I've got to multiply. What's the probability of flipping tails? Is that one out of two? Okay. Probability of selecting a king? Four out of 52. So in the calculator, you just multiply those together. I think it ends up being like 1 out of 26. So guys, like just drawing the king, you get a, I think it's like a 1 in 13 chance. But if you add having to flip a coin to it, it makes it harder to happen. 1 out of 13 is more likely than 1 out of 26. How do I know that? Because with fractions, the bigger the bottom number gets, the closer it gets to zero. So if I was just trying to pick a king, I have one out of 13. If I want to pick the king and get the tails, it, it goes down to one out of 26. And you can look at the decimals yourself if you don't believe me. But that's how fractions work. The bigger the bottom number gets, the closer it gets to zero. Okay, the next one, it says uh, using a six-sided die. This one we, are, we already said it was independent. Um, using a six-sided die, what is the probability of rolling a three on the first roll and then um, on the second roll, rolling a three again? So, let me see. And then, there's the key word again. So, we want to find the probability of rolling a three and then a probability of rolling the three again. So, on a six-sided die, this is one out of six and it's one out of six again for a final of one out of 36. So when you're rolling die, if you want to get the same number twice, it could happen, but it's not very likely. You have a 1 in 36 chance of, of doing that. And what that means like in real life is like you would have to throw the die 36 times for it to come up once. That's what 1 in 36 means. Okay, the next one. Now, I, I understand like up above I gave you these other formulas for dependent, but we're actually still going to use the independent formula on this one, because the only time we ever really use these is when we use when we actually see these symbols. So these symbols are not in the problem, so we don't really have to worry about it. So it says, you have a bag of five marbles. Oh, we already said this was dependent. You have a bag of five marbles. Three are green and two are blue. What's the probability of drawing a green marble, not putting it back, and then drawing another green? Oh, I skipped one, huh? That's okay, we'll do number four anyways. We're going to find the probability of drawing a green marble, do not put it back, and then get another green. So we want probability of green, keyword, keyword, where is it? I'll put it back. And then, so we're going to do probability of green times probability of green. Now here's how probability works. These people are kind of, uh, I guess they're like optimists. I'll use the green marker. How many, how many marbles do we have? It says five. And it says three of them are green. So the first probability is three. Three out of five. Now here's where probability gets just a little weird. If I want the same event two times in a row, we're going to assume that it happened. So I wanted to pick a green. We're going to say, okay, I got it. 
I got the green. So what's going to happen now is, oh my god, not equals times. We're going to only have four marbles left. And since I'm doing green two times in a row, we're going to assume that I got it the first time. So now there's only two green marbles left. Now in probability, that's just the way it works. You always assume that you got it the first time. So then this one ends up being, what, like 3 out of 10? But our probability is 3 out of 10 on this one. Number three, what's the probability of drawing an ace on the first draw and then drawing a spade on the second draw? So I'm not going to write the formula, but let's see. Uh, without replacing, that's important. And then we have the and then. And then tells us we're multiplying. So probability of drawing uh, an ace. There's four aces out of the 52 cards. It says we're not replacing it, so automatically that makes the bottom 51. And then we want to draw a spade the second time. There are 13 spade cards in there. And guys, see on this one, like we don't care if they're overlap. There's, there's no such thing with, with multiplying. It's only with adding. That's when we get that double counting to occur. And then I don't know what this fraction is going to be because the number is going to be big. Four, I don't know. Someone multiply for me. One on what? One on 51? Thank you. So you can see, like, right here versus this one right here. The 1 out of 51 is even less likely to occur than the 1 out of 36 because the bottom number got even bigger than 36. So that means it's less likely to happen. Okay, so I'm going to go back to these um, symbols up at the top and just tell you what they mean. They're not a big deal. Um, they require a little bit of reading, but I don't think it's going to be an issue. So the first thing I want you to notice is the pattern. So both of these, they say the word and. But look at the pattern. Do you guys know what alternating means? Yeah, it's kind of like switching it, right? So look at this. This is A and then B and A. Like A, B, A, right? It's alternating. If you do the other one, you got B, A, B. So they're always alternating in these formulas. So you don't have to memorize both formulas. Just know that in this type of formula, it's alternating. So Here's what this symbol right here means. Well, that's actually how you read it. The, the symbol is given. So this is a dependent event. The probability of event A and event B happening is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. Now, you don't have to even understand what that means, guys, because in these types of problems, it's straight up substitution. That's all you have to do. So watch this. I'll, I'll show you the formulas down here at the bottom, or the problems at the bottom. So you should already know right away that we're going to use the formula because look at this. It's got the symbol in it. So if I want to find the probability of A and B happening, so probability of A and B, Look at what they give me. They give me probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. And then it's straight up substitution. What values do I have? I have this one right here. This is 0 0.6. I have that one. That's 0 0.13. So I just got to type it in the calculator. our answer. Now guys, take a look at the next one, the one that's to the right. It's kind of similar, but not really. Um, if you look at this one, didn't they only give us two? Right? It's 
pretty easy when they give you two. All you have to do is times them. But on that one, they gave us three, so it's kind of up to us to figure out which one we need to use. There's too much information there. We only need two of them. So let's take a look at our formulas one more time. The formula says we either use A and then BA, or we use B and then AB. Let's figure out what they gave us. They gave us A. Oh, you know what I could do? Watch this. They gave us A like an inventory. They gave us that one. They gave us B. They gave us this one. And they gave us AB. They gave us this one. So this is the formula I want to use. I can't use the other formula because there's two different unknowns here. I need to have two numbers in here in order to use the formula. So I don't need the probability of A. This right here is just to throw you off. So the formula says take probability of B and multiply it by the probability of A given that B has occurred. So it's just 0 0.76 times 0 0.5. Point three. And by the way, guys, anytime, anytime you see this line right here, these are definitely dependent events. Guaranteed 100% of the time. Uh, well, 99% of the time. Let me show you an example off to the board here. Let's say if I, if I was going to use that formula and it was probability of A times the probability of B given A, um, if your answer is just probability of A, that means it's independent. So it actually, it would be the wrong formula to use. And you don't have to even worry about that. I don't even know why I said that now that I think about it. Okay, these questions are just like the test. Ms. Prather last, uh, last semester when she taught this, she had the test out while she made these questions. We, we spent the second day on probability because she looked at the test and she was like, oh crap, I didn't teach the kids how to do that. So these are modeled exactly after the test. So pay attention how we do this. <laughs> it's going to sound like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but it'll all make sense when I show you how to do it. So listen to this. This gets confusing at first, but then once you can decode it, I'm going to teach you how to decode all this stuff, it'll get easy. It says, the probability that someone is under six years old is 0 0.37. The probability that someone can read given that they are under six years old is 0 0.59. The probability that someone is under six years old given that they can read is 0 0.45. What is the probability of a person selected at random is under six years old and can read? Now guys, I have a secret for you. Read the very last sentence. You know our formulas, they only have two events, right? A and B. So let's pick one of these or let's let's label them. Yeah, let's do that. Let's make under six years old, let's make that event A. And then they can read, we'll make that B. And guys, it doesn't matter how you label it. It absolutely does not matter. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go through the problem and see what information they gave us. It says the probability that someone is under six. Here's under six, that's an A. So I'm going to write this down. Probability of A is equal to 0 0.37. What's uh, the probability that someone can read? That's B, right? But you guys see this keyword? The word given is that line. And then here's under six. So that right there is probability of B given A. And that answer right there is 0 0.59. The next one. The next one says the probability that someone is under six. So we said under six is A. Here's A. But then there's the word given again. Given that they can read, they can read, that's B. 
So this one is probability of A given B. Oh gosh. So that one is 0 0.45. Okay, so watch this. Here's the real question. What is the probability that a person is under six and can read? So we have to figure out which formula we're going to use. Which one? Yeah, it's actually the first two. And you know how you can tell? Well, it's got to do the alternating stuff. Yeah, it's got to do the alternating stuff. We'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, and we'll probably do the assignment tomorrow in class. Bye.